How important is it for a wrestler to, to eat right and to be hitting the gym? Well, I'm not sure I'm the, uh, the perfect example of that, but, uh, you know, it is, it is important, especially for somebody my age, 35 going on 36, you know, the metabolism doesn't work as well as it used to, so I've got to eat a lot cleaner now than I ever had to when I was a kid. Um, so, you know, obviously it's important. It's important for a variety of things. Keep your mind right and all that type of stuff. So, kids, listen, eat right. You know, I like my parent pizza like anybody else, but uh, during the week I try to eat clean. You've traveled around the world. Did you did you have any problems eating that world cuisine, whether you were in Australia or Japan or Mexico? No, I mean, I'm, I'm an eater, man. You know, I, I love food. I love cooking. I love eating. I love everything about, you know, culinary delight. So I think that's one of the things that I actually enjoy about traveling is kind of immersing yourself not only in the wrestling culture of these different countries, but also in their local customs and food especially. I mean, uh... I don't think anybody, anything's ever really treated me wrong because I've been to the water in Mexico, but uh, that was a rookie mistake. <laughs> they always say don't don't go for the water. <laughs> That's right. You know, I don't, I don't think it matters what year it is. Uh, I think the, the end of the world title is the Godfather of all modern wrestling championships in our country. and should be respected and treated as such. I mean, when you look at all the major companies that have come and gone in this country, they all own to, to, a, to a man, if you will, and can trace their lineage back at some point to that championship. So when you look at it in that perspective and in those terms, I think it deserves a certain distinction. I think it deserves a certain respect. And I always kind of prided myself when I was wearing that 10 pounds of gold to, to be a guy that would treat it like guys like Jack Briscoe and Harley Race and Ric Flair did. And I think to a large degree, I was pretty successful with that. Oh, awesome. I mean, it's, you know, again, it's somebody that I've had a relationship with for Jeez, I think about it, what year is it, 2013, so I mean, you know, 15 plus years. Uh, we've known each other since we were teenagers, and to be able to travel the world with somebody like that, uh, and not just um, not just that, but, you know, it, it's, it's a big part of our lives that has been spent in the midst of one another, and, and anytime you're around people that you consider friends or close friends or in our case brothers, you know, you, you, you relish and you cherish that time. And it just so happened that we got to go on the road and, and work with each other as well, which made life a lot easier, frankly. He's a tremendous talent. I think it's criminal that he's not a millionaire. And uh, I loved every second of it. How was that whole experience working with TNA and doing the whole gut check thing? It was great. Loved it. I, and, and I laughed. And I'm not laughing or mocking you necessarily, but somebody said it perfectly the other day. Uh, reality television is scripted television. Pro wrestling is scripted television. So why wouldn't a reality segment on a pro wrestling television show also be scripted television? I think fans forget that what you're watching on TV is not real. It was awesome seeing you on uh, on national television, and I'm sure it helped uh, getting that exposure out there for fans who might not have seen you. Because you're you're a rare breed of guy who you might be new to a lot of fans, but you've again you've been around for 15 years, and you definitely uh, your work in the ring tells it tells it all. Yeah, no, I mean obviously it would be stupid I think to uh, to not look at that couple weeks of national television exposure as a huge positive. I mean that's uh, the main reason, among others, why I decided to to do the spot to begin with. I mean, uh, they asked me, uh, I don't know, six eight months ago, whatever Joey Ryan's spot was, that was supposed to be mine, and I turned it down. So uh, I'm not going to crucify gut check, uh, although I don't know necessarily what the end result of this segment was supposed to be. I mean, I think I know what they were going for, trying to capture some of that reality TV magic. But at the end of the day, I'm not sure I really did anything for anybody, including TNA. I think a lot of that time that they wasted on gut check could have been spent in other areas to get other guys over. But that said, uh, you know, I said this publicly, I'll say it again. I got everything I, expect, I expected out of gut check. Oh, oh hey, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's at the end of the day, you know, as long as you got, you know, you got what you had to get out of it, you know. But of course, another thing that uh, stay on top of TNA, they had August first uh, coming. Actually, before I talk about August first, I did want to mention this. Um, during that time, you had gut check. I, I'll never forget this. Um, you posted a series of things on Facebook um, saying that you know TNA is giving the opportunity. 
uh, to open the door and you're going to kick it in. And personally, me reading all this stuff and knowing your story, I got to say, man, I got I got sucked into it. I got I was I was into it. Your words really inspired uh, myself and I'm sure a lot of other people what you said. Um, and I, you know, I, I got to thank you for that because those, regardless of what the situation was, you did uh, not just besides the national exposure. I think you did give people some hope and you inspired people in, in what you said, not just in wrestling but in life. When you when you get an opportunity and people open that door to knock it down, I thought that was really cool of you. I appreciate that, and, and uh, you know, it, there's, there's a lot of talented producers at TNA uh, that don't get a lot of credit, and uh, I've been fortunate enough to work with them in the past, and, and it made it easy when it came to trying to capture, you know, what the story was supposed to be for me and my gut check experience, and, uh, you know, obviously longevity in the business, etc. and then what you just talked about, I mean, it was an easy, I think an easy thing to, to creatively latch onto from a personal level. Just thinking about it, I mean, these are things, when I said on TV, is no different what I tell, what I was telling guys when I was running Ring of Honor, you know, I mean, it still gives you an opportunity, the onus is on you to, to make whatever you can of that opportunity, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity that DNA. Awesome, and oh, you did, you did have some fun, though, uh, with the this August 1st stuff, uh, you, you know, you, you had fun with the fans, and like you said, you know, the, the, there is... Fans often forget uh, the nature of the beast that is pro wrestling. And with that, you know, there's a lot of liberties and fun to be had. And you were asking people about uh, when August 1st was coming around. You even uh, posted a video uh, <laughs> uh, about that, that that had some comedy to it. What, uh, how did that come about with you? What, what were you trying to do with those videos? Well, first of all, I think I deserve an Annie Award for that video. <laughs> um, but I think it was brilliantly done. If I can do my own award, to uh, No, man, it's just like you said. You know, I, I, uh, I think people that know me know I like to have fun with stuff. And it seemed like instantly, as soon as TNA was hyping, someone coming in who appeared to be bald, um, you know, my Facebook and Twitter started going crazy with people thinking it was me. I, I'm not sure exactly why that is when there's several million bald men in our country. <laughs> but... That said, I mean, it's an opportunity to keep your face out there and your name out there. And, and uh, you know, self-promotion is is a, a main facet of our business, particularly on an independent level. When you don't have a multi-million dollar machine behind you promoting you, you've got to find ways to do that yourself. And it was an easy way to do it. You know, it didn't cost me anything. And it frankly put a lot of attention on my brand and my character. And like you said, it was a lot of fun. So to me, it was a no-brainer. Yeah, I mean, and, and you're one of those guys. You've lasted longer than a lot of other guys um, in this business, and your career is still striving. Um, and you know, you do things like this. But how else, you know, have have you been able to maintain uh, such longevity uh, in a business that doesn't always uh, serve that? I do the business. I treat people the right way. I know it sounds very cliche, but when your mama teaches you when you're a little boy that. You should treat people the way you want to be treated. She's telling you the truth. People always ask me, how do you stay so booked? And how are you all there? I mean, I'm fortunate. I'm one of these guys who is able to make a lot of living doing independent professional wrestling. I don't have a day job. I haven't had a day job in nearly a decade. And I think that's a testament to doing people right, treating people the right way, and helping promotions and promoters who are trying to make money themselves find a way to do that using a character like me. Um, you know, I think uh, I think having an understanding of basic business helps, and uh, I attribute that to education. Every time a young wrestler asks me what I should do, I tell them to go back to college. Uh, and I'm very grateful that I did that because I think it teaches life lessons that you don't get a chance to learn otherwise. Wrestling and the wrestling business is not for everybody. It's nice to nobody. It's, it's very self-serving very much out for itself. Yeah, and if you're not careful, it would chew you up and you out. But again, if you got a head on your shoulders and you do the right things and you treat people the right way, you can hang around for a little while. You may not make a million dollars, but uh, you might make a million friends. I love that. I love it. I think I like it um, in some respects more than I like the performance aspect of pro wrestling. Um, I think I've always kind of been a, a storyteller, not just uh, in the ring, but uh, more importantly, outside. And, and the two years that I ran Ring of Honor's wrestling operations are among the, the most fun years that I've had in the business. You know, it's uh, an opportunity to find yourself and learn other aspects of our business. And uh, another way to make yourself um, viable and, and create some longevity. I mean, it's 
anything else. I don't care if you're a plumber, a plant fitter, or you work at Walmart. The more things you can do, the more valuable you are. Where do you see your career going from here? Great question. Don't know. I think that's. Uh, I think that's the, the, the good part about life is that uh, you know it's never ending sea of opportunities that come, and it's up to us to take advantage of those that present themselves. I mean, uh, reality is I'm a 35 year old man. Do you think these, in general, uh, a lot of people in Indy should tone it down in terms of what they're doing? What you 
do between the booths. It's more importantly than that, why? And you know, it's, uh, I wanted to share a story with you because uh, I, I do take a lot of what you're you're saying right now to, to heart. Um, I I've started uh, my uh, career in wrestling uh, recently, and I was in this uh, I was in a battle royal, and before we were going over the match, these guys, one of these guys, and mind you, this was a battle royal. One of these guys wanted to do a spot where uh, he was going to powerbomb me, and then the guy, his partner, was going to do a flying senton in a battle royal. Now, I had enough, I, I knew enough to say no to the spot and, you know, uh, disagree with it. And thankfully, I didn't do it. Unfortunately, one of those guys got hurt because they were doing some sort of high spot. But um, my question is, too, is when you're, as, as a young wrestler, what, uh, how do you. Like, how do you deal in terms of working with the match, in terms of, like, uh, working with the guy and saying, hey, maybe we shouldn't do this, maybe we shouldn't do that, and without, you know, having the other guy get all off the handle? Well, if the guy gets all off the handle, then he's at work, and obviously he only turns like he's the shit in, if I can say that. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we have to remember, as wrestlers, as professionals, that we I was trained that you go in a battle royale, you just pretty much punch and kick. I mean, I, it's like a lot of times, you know, for certain companies, you know, I do, a lot of people get it, and they, they want to tell a story, but I think a lot of, yeah, like, everybody just wants to get their stuff in, and, and they forget that there's a, a story to be told. We're not out there to do moves, man. You know, if you could teach any monkey how to bump, and how to throw a dropkick, and how to do a move, how to do this, and how to do that, that's not the art form. The art form of professional wrestling is taking your audience captive audience that spent their money on a ticket to come and watch you perform on a real tangible, legitimate, emotional ride. And how do you do that? Sometimes that's via physicality, absolutely. More times than not, that's through body language and, and here's the buzzword, selling. 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 Blast me, what's the number one thing you tell people they need to do more? Sell. Everybody, we included, sell. Sell, sell, sell. That's what this is all about. How the baby trains get over? Sympathy. How do you get sympathy? By selling. Mm How -hmm. do you get heat? For the baby trains selling for him. You know, heat and selling, man. That's what this is all about. Can't have one without the other. You couldn't have said it. Uh, I couldn't have said it better. And what you know? So I was speaking my training. How did uh? What was it like for you, uh, you know, uh, when you came in, uh, training and then getting into the independent scene? What was all that like for you? I was very different than it is today. I'm not, I'm not saying that's a good or bad thing. I broke in November of 95, so we're talking about the very infancy of, of the, quote, Internet age. I mean, uh, I didn't even have it then. In 95, there were no cell phones. There was no YouTube, there was no Facebook, there was none of the stuff that we have today. Um, so making yourself accessible wasn't a problem. Getting people to know and see you, that was an issue. It was very much still the day and age of finding a promoter who, number one, videotaped their matches. Uh, and I said videotaped, there was no digital back like then. Uh, that could give you a copy of it, and then you'd have to dub it on another VHS, then you'd have to mail that on email real mail to the promoter who may be on the other side of the country. Then you'd have to call that guy a bunch of times to, to verify, number one, if he even got the package. And number two, if you watched it. I mean, it, it, was, it, it was a drawn-out process. Whereas today, we have you know, the ability within 15 minutes to have our match on our 
phone and email to somebody or put on YouTube at the, at the, at the blink of an eye. You know, I mean, in terms of how fast things move in this day and age, uh, night and day, and, and the training itself, I mean, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I think guys of my generation complain about the guys of today's generation, but that's not that's any different than the guys of the generation before me complaining about me. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, and did you have that, I mean, especially with all that work you had to do to get yourself noticed, did you have that pre pressure to get out, to do as many shows as you could to get noticed, and did you, you know, do those shots where you traveled, uh, you know, 400 miles, uh, you know, to and four, if you got to pay a slice of pizza, but, you know, you're getting your face out there. Did you did you have a lot of that uh, during during the your, your beginning of your career? Of course, I mean I think anybody who who has the desire, and I think that's the kind of right word. Uh, you asked me if I had the pressure to do that. No, there was no pressure whatsoever because I loved it. That's what I wanted to do. Right. Because keep in mind, I didn't I didn't grow up as a kid wanting to be a wrestler. I had no interest in becoming a pro wrestler. I wanted to play football my whole life, and so I never had. The dreams and aspirations necessarily that a lot of guys had who grew up only wanting to be a pro wrestler. Cole Cabana is a great, great example of that. His whole life, all he ever wanted to do was work for the WWF. I didn't have that. So getting into wrestling and falling in love with it on, on a much deeper level later in, in my development allowed me to kind of capture a lot of, of these desires later on when I was a little bit more mature to understand it. Once I was 17, 18, and I was in the thing, I was hooked. So there was no pressure. I mean, I was happy to get in the car with Dave Brady that I could drive 12 hours to Pittsburgh for 20 bucks. You know what I mean? As stupid as that sounds today, you know, we didn't even think about it. You got in the car and go. And that's what you did. And uh, people talk about sacrifice. We never looked at it like that, I don't think, as a kid. And we're sacrificing. Oh, damn, we're having this Thanksgiving. Like, I never thought about that as a sacrifice. We couldn't wait to get in the car and go. And so you you never um you never really as a kid you never saw wrestling coming into your life how how did it uh, how did it come into your life like what made you uh, get into wrestling? Let's talk about that. You mentioned you suffered a, a neck injury, and then you also just brought up you had the, the acute muscular uh, compartment syndrome. And oh, obviously, these are things you know. For most people, I mean, this would stop anyone on their tracks, and you know, they they would never be heard from again. But it kept you going. Well, what advice would you give to people who maybe they suffer an injury or they suffer a setback? I was going to happen at some point if I 
was going to be active or athletic in any way. Um, I'm glad it happened when it did. Um, I certainly wasn't that. Because as you say, man, I mean, think about it. Think about your 17 years old. And I had letters from Penn State, Florida State, and Michigan, and uh, every Division One football college that you want to, to look at. I had letters from. And then one day it's just gone. And you go from 285 pounds to 210 pounds. And you don't eat. And you're depressed. And uh, you think your life's ending again. You're, you're 17 years old, right? You're not emotionally mature enough to handle all of this negativity, this pressure, this surgery, this physical ailment that you came into. It's not your fault. All these things. Um, I think I hit a rock bottom emotionally at a very young age. It allowed me to have a different perspective on things going forward. So fast forward, geez, 15 years, and, and I compress my vertebrae and severely sprained my neck. I crush the brachial plexus nerve bundle on my right side. And I can't feel my right arm. And how scary is that? Yeah. And, and thankfully, you know, through rehabilitation and, and, and through a lot of work, I'm to a point now where the nerve damage that I have lingering is very minor. And, and some people say, well, how can you say nerve damage is minor? And I guess, you know, I mean, perspective, you can have a perspective on it, but, you know, um, we all have our choices. We all have our opportunities. I mean, it goes back to desire. Do you have a desire to carry, to carry forward? And as a kid, going about that desire, I had to live. So you get past the compartment syndrome, you have surgery, you convalesce, you get better, you move forward with your life. You know, when I'm 33 at that point, and, and feel, and feel that I broke my back, and deal with all this nerve issue after the fact, you know, you have a choice to be made. And am I done? Uh, should I be done? Do I want to be done? All these questions go through your head. How am I going to pay my bills? You know, and then real life takes it. And I think I made the right choice. What happened with my neck was an accident, much like what happened with Mike Bennett and BJ was an accident. Of course. And uh, you either choose to move past that or you don't. And I'm happy I did. Very good. I mean, that's uh, and it's, uh, I, I think the best way either, uh, as you said, you either choose to move past it or you don't. And uh, I mean, that's kind of been the story of your career. I mean, you've always moved move past any setbacks you know, you've had and uh, here you are today still having a striving career and uh, before uh, we end the interview uh, why don't you just uh, you know give the fans a, some more info where where can we find uh, the seven levels of hate DVD any um, pre-order uh, I, I think you had a signature edition that you had just announced uh, the other day uh, what, what, what else do we need to know about this uh, seven levels of hate
Yeah, I mean, it sounds like a great project. I've been following the story for, you know, since its inception, so I look forward to, to watching it. And uh, do you have any upcoming shows um, the f fans should know about? Yeah, sure. I mean, of course, I still got to pay my bills and feed my kids. So uh, Saturday I'll be in Kansas City for Metro Pro Wrestling, and Sunday I'll be in Pompano Beach, Florida for Ring Warriors. Uh, the rest of my dates you can find where are they? Probably on my Facebook, and now, of course, I don't even know what the damn address is, but if you search my name on Facebook, you can find where I'm going to be, and, of course, on Twitter, Scrap Daddy AP, of course, I'll plug all the, uh, all the pertinent information there as well, as, uh, in addition to all the stupid that I normally have on there, so, um, yeah, man, lots going on, lots of good stuff. Uh, and, uh, Kevin, actually, I have a question, Kevin Williams wants to know when you're coming back down to the East Coast. Question, love the East Coast. Unfortunately, living in San Diego, my flights are not cheap. So I would thank a lovely company for that issue. But uh, let me see. When the next time I'm going to be out, well, Florida technically is the East Coast. We know that, right? Of course, yeah. Yeah. Uh, beyond that, I'll be in Virginia September 28th and 29th for NWA Fusion. That's in the, uh, where am I flying to? Richmond area, of course, on the East Coast as well. And, and uh, I'd love to get up north. I mean, I miss New York, man. I wish there was somebody out there who had deep pockets who didn't mind spending a couple bones, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know what? I'm like, I'll, I'll try to talk to a couple of guys. We'll try to get you over here. I love it. <laughs> All right, man. Thanks Thanks for joining us once again. It's uh, Seven Levels of Hate. And then I, fans could also uh, find you uh, on Twitter at Scrap Daddy, uh, AP. Adam Pierce is a search name as well as Facebook. Uh, it's been an awesome interview. Uh, learned a lot, and I hope the people uh, watching this also learned a lot. Thanks, thanks for coming on. Thanks, George. Take care, my man. All right. See you when I see you.